Hi everyone, welcome to week five. Um, this week we're going to be returning to our pedagogical intentions that we were thinking with at the beginning of the term, thinking with um, the article by Christina Delgado Vintimilo, What is Pedagogy? and Leanne Berisimoke Simpson's um, Land as Pedagogy. So we're going to be thinking again about our pedagogical commitments and how the arts enable us to live these commitments. So in this way, um, the how of our pedagogies matter and the arts enable us um, to live our commitments in particular ways. So when we return from our reading break, we're going to be orienting ourselves into our inquiry projects. And so I want to bring us back into thinking about some of our pedagogical commitments that will frame how these inquiry processes and projects emerge. Um, so we can ask ourselves, what are our educational projects in response to? What is education for? What ideas about knowledge making how it happens and the ethics of that do we want to ground ourselves in and again what are our pedagogical commitments so in this program we're holding a reconceptualist feminist ethic in curriculum making it's feminist because it's interested in what sarah ahmed describes as creating new modes of existence shared actions for and with others that seek to live better to live well in an unjust world so what are your concerns for living well together in the place you are situated? And how does this desire um, or your concerns frame what you're able to see? So it's about creating allegiances and relations with others in the pursuit um, of a collective life, something uh, that can't be burdened alone. And so with this intention, um, how we enact curriculum is much more of a choreography with others in generating ideas and sustaining attention to new and generative, generative meanings together. It's not about providing activities or individual learning. It's a social construction of knowledge and meaning, a communication and a creation of meaning that is significant, not only to the individual, but also to the collective. And um, in yesterday's curriculum conversation, um, Sylvia spoke to this so beautifully um, and gave some very um, tangible examples of how, as educators, our roles are to listen to ideas of children and to bring them to the group um, so that ideas can travel across the collective. So it's not only, um, you know, an individual idea that belongs to a child, but our role as educators is to help that idea travel across the group and bring multiple others into their into this idea so that meaning emerges from the collective. So situating Betta Samoke Simpson's article within this course and in our upcoming inquiry work, we can ask ourselves, um, how does settler colonialism position the child and the educator? What are the logics or tendencies of child development in early childhood education and how might this be related um, in Canada's ongoing settler colonial project via education? Um, it's often the case that long inquiry projects and the possibility of co-constructing ideas with children are inhibited or muddled by developmental logics that instrumentalize events in the service of the individual child's learning, where ideas are taken literally and taught over top of or explained away by educators, or um, that the ability to dwell and slow down our processes are interrupted by governing schedules and the divisions of the day. Um, many times developmentalism is sneaky and it inhabits our ways of being with children without our notice, um, where too often the child becomes the focus of inquiry and we resort back to activities um, that serve them rather than struggling through the work of figuring out together how to think more about a particular idea that also interests us too. Um, or we see the child as pure or innocent, 
separate from the tensioned places that they are actually a part of um, and somehow outside of settler colonial society. So we can ask ourselves here, thinking with this article, what does developmentalism desire? How might these desires unwittingly show up in our inquiry projects? How do these desires make, make impossible, um, or sorry, what do these desires make impossible and how might we notice and resist them? So what is possible beyond a developmental desire? And in Betty Smoke Simpson's article, she doesn't speak directly to child development as um, sort of an ally of settler colonial projects, but in some ways we can notice the ways that she's speaking to the structures of education and what those structures render impossible. And in early childhood, our structures are very much governed by child development. So I think that it's important for us to think about that um, and to notice the ways that those logics might bubble up um, or unwittingly come about in our inquiry projects. So developmentalism makes pedagogy almost impossible as it continues our focus on the individual and prescribes a definition of who one ought to be and become. But pedagogy, rather, is that which thinks, studies, and orients education, as Cristina Delgado Vintimilla tells us, its purposes, its protagonists, its histories, its relations, and processes. Pedagogical thought lives within the tension between theory and practice, between what happens and the reflection on what happened. So thinking about this, pedagogy really needs the arts as a way of orienting to this in-betweenness of things in place and time and the qualities of a particular experience. This is something that the arts enable us to do. Um, Christina also says that pedagogy is always interrogating and responding to the conditions of our time and its status quo. Pedagogy then needs the arts to interrogate the conventional, seeing the actual freshly and creating what lies beyond it. That's um, an idea borrowed from our reading this week by Elliot Eisner. Christina says, pedagogy is interested in the creation of an experience that will produce particular forms of subjectivity. And Eisner tells us, the arts enable pedagogy to invent a way of being in the world. So we need the arts to create ways of being that generate multiplicity, as Sylvia reminded us yesterday in the curriculum conversations. So in this week's reading, um, Eisner tells us that the work in the arts is not only a way of creating performances and products, it's a way of creating our lives by expanding our consciousness, shaping our dispositions, and satisfying our quest for meaning, establishing contact with others, and sharing and creating a culture. So the arts give us languages not only to communicate our ideas, but also to create ways of being together, of responding to each other and responding to difference. So language creates worlds, languages generate meanings and ways of being together. And one example that I find so profound um, in thinking about how language creates worlds um, beyond only modes of communication um, is the Andean Quechua word, hawapacha. It means the world above, a way of thinking the sky that is so generous and abundant. Um, and in a similar but different way, artistic languages enable ideas to emerge in a particular way and gather meaning. So as we've discussed in drawing, as an example, it's not that an idea just comes out on, on paper and you know is plopped on the paper. An idea is drawn out. Um, it's made in the making of a mark and the response that that mark generates. And as Eisner writes, once into the sea, the ship rides of the currents of the ocean, which also sets the course. So we're thinking about inquiry as a way of holding on to an idea, forming and becoming formed by it. So it's always a response and it's always an ongoing pursuit um, that emerges from a particular way um, 
of thinking through a language. So it's about processes of uh, processes of representing this idea are mediated through the form we use to think and make it into being. And for this, you can see more um, this week, Eisner on page eight, he speaks particularly to um, this idea that how an, an idea is mediated through the form that we use to think it through. And this could be particularly helpful in your, um, in your short papers that are due on the 15th. So in this way, we're thinking about an idea as always becoming and it's always emerging through the making of something. And so with this, um, we can think with um, this quote by Donna Haraway when she says, it matters what matters we use to think other matters with. It matters what stories we tell to tell other stories with. It matters what knots, not knots, what thoughts think thoughts, what descriptions describe descriptions, what ties tie ties. It matters what worlds world worlds. And so this makes me think about how our methods, how our languages create realities. And this is what I mean by how, how really matters. So last week we read a short blog post by Linda Knight that makes visible some of the correspondences between thought and making. And she uses drawing as a way of noticing the effectual knowledges that are produced in the process of making. And she says that drawing um, and perhaps making in general, there's an interrelating uh, of the corporal, sensorial and material and this helps to produce offshoots of thought and action. Um, she speaks specifically to affect and how affect hones in on the micro, meso, macro, physical, and metaphysical reactions. Um, that in thinking affect, we're in close range and we're attending to highly detailed content. And she says that through experiencing the materiality of drawing, or for example, dancing, painting, um, with others, we're exposed to impromptu decisions that occur as a drawing is created or some other form of representation. So there are minor gestures um, and responses that are enacted in this process of making an idea. And she also says that artistic processes take us into a creative imminent space no, nothing is for certain and nothing happens in the same way twice. Ideas, theorizations, imaginings continue to emerge in the process and material and force foregrounds thinking. So this is something that we can think with as we move next week into our inquiry projects, thinking about um, how, you know, becoming open and becoming vulnerable and susceptible to the world means being open to its ongoing emergence and that we're never going to encounter it the same. And this requires, um, you know, different methods of, of inquiry. So moving beyond existing standards of practice that legitimize educative methods. So our frameworks for what counts as knowledge are radically different when we're taking this approach um, this reconceptualist approach to inquiry. We're not measuring ourselves um, by a baseline of developmental psychology um, or from a Taylorist view of education, um, but rather when we're thinking of emergent inquiry, um, our processes are framed and formed um, through pedagogical documentation as a way of making visible what's mattering in what's happening. Um, and also to trace um, some of the, the moments that shimmer um, or some of the ideas um, that emerge in our processes of making. So documentation enables us to see what's happening and, and what is mattering in what's happening. And we're going to speak to that more uh, in the coming weeks. 